Right, um, first thing, so declaration of interest. Can I ask if any members here have any interest to declare? Members provide the details of any interest they're going to declare. Anything? No? Good. Um, apologies for absence. Uh, Claire, can you report any absences, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've received apologies from councillors Mancini Boyle, Karine Guvenlu, Murrell, Beadle, L. Starling, and Hempsall. Thank you very much. So, next item is the minutes of the council meeting held on the 22nd of February 2024. So, can I refer members to the minutes at page seven of the agenda? Um, can I ask members to indicate by a show of hands if they are happy to approve them as a true and accurate record? Thanks, can I have a point of information or point of uh, minute, please? Because um, the minutes for me are not a true and accurate record because I was um, chastised for not voting for having to leave the room and go to the toilet, and my uh, vote was an abstention, which is not recorded. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Okay, can I ask if there's any matters arising at all? Sorry, can I, just, can I just go back? I raised my hand just before everybody raised their hand, um, because I just wanted to pick up on uh, the wording in the last paragraph on page 14, uh, where it states, Councillor N. Starling noted that four years ago the Conservative administration had opted for the maximum permitted increase in council tax, etc., 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 which to me, when I read that, indicated that he had been at that meeting. And I, I think that he was expressing maybe an opinion or hearsay. Um, so I would, I would request that the word noted be replaced with gave the, uh, his opinion, his personal opinion of what he felt had happened by looking at or talking to people about what had happened four years before then. Because it reads to me as if the council uh, members have noted that something happened four years ago as if they were there. So if you can just um, have a look at that and perhaps come back with a more um, realistic term for that. Thank you. Yeah, we'll look to change that to use words stated rather than noted. So on to announcements, can so ask members to note the chairman's engagements. So that was sent separately to the full agenda, which shows all the full engagements of the chair. Um, and the next item, a few announcements, announcements for myself as chair. Obviously, as you can see, I'm chairing tonight in place of Caroline. Um, she's unfortunately unwell and in hospital at the moment, quite unwell. So I'm hoping everybody here will agree with me that we hope Caroline makes a full recovery and a speedy recovery and is back here for the next meeting. So. Uh, we wish all, all the best. Thank you. Um, and next, we'll ask for any other announcements. Any other announcements from the leader, please? Um, yes, just just one, really, to say that um, I attended the uh, District Council Network Conference representing Broadland last month, and uh, I found it was not only interesting, but it was very useful. Um, there were MPs from each of the main parties there, um, there were activities that were going on that looked at various things that we were involved with. There was a lot of talk about how the DCN had been working to uh, try to improve the funding for councils of our style and size. Um, and so there was a lot of really good stuff that came out of it. Um, I think also there's some of the issues that were raised which were looking at um, what future development might be in the future with the local government structures depending on what happens in, in the next set of elections and also looking at the role of AI interestingly in our, our digital lives. So those things were really useful to discuss and I think um, it was appreciated that Broadland actually took part. So that's, that's all I just want to say about that. Thank you. Next, we go on to any announcement from members of the Cabinet. Who wants to go first there? Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, as uh, Portfolio for Environment, I did attend a water summit um, 
called to address the role of water supply um, in uh, sustaining housing delivery, economic growth, and so on across the region, um, recognizing the inability of water supplies to support the planned developments, perhaps the planned development needs of the region, and that strategies will need to be developed to optimize water usage uh, and the responsible management of our environment. So I think it was a very important summit uh, which raised some very critical issues for us to consider going forward. Um, so I have written a report on that, which uh, will be circulated um, uh, to members, uh, which gives uh, a bit more detail on those issues. Thank you. Who next from Cabinet? Councillor Harpley. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to let everybody know that I have just completed domestic abuse champion training. Um, apparently, I'm the first councillor at Broadland to do that, so I'm very proud of that. But just to make it very clear, if you look on Connect, all of the council's domestic abuse champions are listed. Now, just because I am a councillor, that doesn't mean that any other councillor who has concerns around domestic abuse has to come to me. Anybody with any concerns around domestic abuse, they just want some advice, they can go to any of the champions, regardless of whether we're councillors or members. So please have a look, familiarise yourself with who the champions are, how to contact us, and it is completely confidential. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more cabinet members got any announcements to make? Yeah. So over to Trevor. Any announcements? Yeah. Chairman, thank you. Just that um, members would wish to note that uh, Mr. Ben Burgess has rejoined the one team and is now back in the building as our new AD planning and CNC building control. So I'm sure you'll um, greet him cordially if you see him around the place. Um, a welcome addition to the team. Thank you very much, sir. So on to questions next. Um, I'd like to advise members there's no questions received from uh, members of the public for this evening's meeting. So move on to the next item, which is public speaking. Um, so there's no request from the public to speak this meeting either this evening. So we'll, we'll move on to the next bit, so item seven. So item seven is uh, recommendations arising from a meeting held on uh, Tuesday 19th March 2024 in Cabinet and refer members to the recommendations listed on page 26. So the first one, 7A here, is the adoption of the Greater Norwich Local Plan. So can I invite the leader to present the recommendations from Cabinet, please? Thank you, yes. Um, I have great pleasure in proposing the adoption of the plan. It's taken nearly eight years to get this to this point. Um, it's about average, apparently. I was quite surprised to hear. Having looked, though, at the kind of context through which we have to go to get to this point, there are a number of regulatory periods that you have to cover. I think this council has been quite assiduous in the way it's worked. I think the other thing we should note is that this, this is for the whole of the Greater Norwich area. That means we work with Norwich and with South Norfolk. Um, and it's quite unusual, actually, for, for these kinds of arrangements to work quite so well. Uh, I think it's very important that we note that the inspector's report, uh, which is basically the culmination of the process, has confirmed the plan is sound. That means that it ha there are four main pillars for that. So there is, um, it's positively prepared, it's justified, effective, and it's consistent with national policy. So there are some amendments that have been put forward, some of those related to clarity and some of those related to uh, the passage of time because some things had changed in the time between when it was started and finished, unsurprisingly. Um, so other than that, I think I, we ought to uh, accept that the, this is a greater confidence for our council uh, the government is very keen that every council has a five-year land supply. It gives us much more confidence about where we have applications coming forward. And I believe that there is a plan now that, that these uh, local plans will be required to be renewed more frequently. So I'm pretty confident that once we've adopted this one, the next iteration will begin. Um, but I am heartily uh, in favour of recommending this plan to members. Can we ask for a second for that, please? Councillor Harpley. So now I'd like to invite comments from members, please. Councillor Gurney. Thank you, Vice Chairman. I think it would be remiss of me not to mention tonight, and, and um, I have the support of all my Helston District Councillors here this evening, how disappointed and how saddened we are that the inspector has seen fit to remove Helston Parish's land allocation at the top end of the Reenfram Road. This was the last 
probably final piece of green open space that was in within the parish boundary that we were likely to acquire in the future. The field belongs to a, a, a farmer and um, we have already, as a parish council, leased a third of this field. So there is a precedent set for it actually being leased to parish council for amenity use. And um, the farmer has decided that he would never let us have this piece of land, even if we even attempted a compulsory purchase order. So the inspector has gone along with the landowner's wish and remove this from the plan. Um, I would also add that when this was first included in the plan, that the parish council at the time went to the boundary commission and had the parish boundary changed to encompass this piece of land as well. So it was included in the parish of Helston rather than in the parish of Horsford. But now it's bad, it's very bad and sad news for the parish of Helston and its parishioners who are hopeful in the future of acquiring some additional flat land for um, um, formal amenity space. Um, it is also under the flight path of Norwich Airport, but now my understanding is that it reverts back to agricultural land. So very disappointed. Thank you. Councillor Warner. Thank you, Jim. Um, I just wanted to say, um, echo what the leader said really about this being such a, a huge piece of work across three councils. I think it's really impressive. And the officers have worked very hard. And I know the inspector has decided on a number of modifications and, and that's what examiners do. And that's fair enough. But, I, but at the end of the day, this ensures that we've got a five year land supply. And that's something we absolutely need so we can continue to build houses that we desperately need, neutral neutrality aside, and we'll cover that later, of course. And and, and I just wanted to sort of comment on a, on a couple of things, really, but one particular thing. Obviously, we, we've got the five-year land supply, and we've managed to do that, uh, uh, and obviously the, the examiner was able to remove the the COSI contingency site from the, the plan. So I just want to say, I just want to commend it and um, say what a good piece of work it was. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Clarity, next. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, really, I, I think Councillor Warren has said pretty much what I was going to say. I mean, this has been a uh, long piece of work um, and it's fair to say that Broadland has shown um, some distinct leadership in this piece of work over a period of time. Um, for much of the planned period, um, when uh, that the plan was, was going through due process. Um, we actually chaired the um, GMLP and the GMDP. And Phil Courtier, our director of place, was very, very much instrumental and uh, central to delivering this, this plan for the whole area. Um, and I totally agree with the leader. I mean, it has been policy for some time that effectively you adopt a plan and you, you then effectively move towards a period which will bring another five years in, so you're always working effectively five years ahead. There'd only be one problem with this plan, delivering a number of houses which the ambition of the plan um, actually uh, prescribes or um, allows for, because um, the planning system is, um, I think, by I heard the director of place actually earlier today said that uh, the planning system was difficult and he mentioned some difficulties he was experiencing currently, which he hadn't experienced in his long and distinguished career here at Broadland District Council. So I think it should be noted that this council has to work extremely hard as all the um, members of the GMDP to actually be single-minded in trying to ensure the delivery in all aspects of this plan because if we don't, we will be letting down the people who we are all elected to serve. Um, and as I say, it's a good plan, it's sound, um, it's taken a lot of work, but delivery will be another matter, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Party. After you, Councillor Redmond, please. Thank you. It, endorsing much of what has been said already from both the leader and from Councillor Wymark around the, the soundness of this plan. We're at a point now where we need to be endorsing this plan and moving forwards to secure the five-year land supply. I can entirely understand that some members might 
um, still take issue with some of the allocations within the plan in terms of the annexes, either for the inclusion or the non-inclusion of sites. And it's absolutely right that you express those and make your views known to the local community. But please don't let them be a barrier to endorsing the plan tonight because we need the plan. And I think where we are at the moment, and Phil did ask me to use this analogy again, and apologies you heard me make it at Cabinet, but to change it now is like trying to take an ingredient out of a cake after you've baked it um, at the moment. So, and we need to go forwards and endorse uh, and move forwards. Thank you very much, Councillor Starling. Thank you. Um, when I was on, elected to this council, my first stint as a council head, uh, 2010, um, the five-year land supply was an issue then. And then I stepped away from anything to do with council in 2015. And then I got back involved in parish politics. And then the councillor Clancy coming along and talking about not having a five-year land supply. And I was like, what, what's going on? It was like, well, this, you know, it was eight years. And I, you know, it was sort of, uh, it's like nothing had ever changed. But it just does indicate that the length of time this whole process has taken. I think every councillor should be really grateful we're now at this stage where finally the control gets back to the democratic process rather than being in the hands of developers who have often taken advantage of our lack of a five-year land supply to really shoehorn things in that people have found unacceptable and inappropriate within their communities so i'm endorsing this as did owen this um uh, on the basis that it it's just desperately needed and um it is a sound plan Thank you very much. Councillor Catchpole next. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm afraid that I won't be able to support this local plan. Um, I've lived and breathed the um, development of the plan from the Aylsham perspective um, over the last number of years. And um, just to let, uh, put some context here, um, the Reg 18 consultation happened. There was consultation with residents of the town, um, views were expressed and um, a particular site was, was preferred by the town. When Reg 19 appeared, there were two sites allocated to Aylsham. Um, I don't see the town doesn't the residents of the town the town council don't see that Alsham's interests have been represented on the decision making body during this process um, yes we think there should be houses but we want to see the right kind of houses and um, other facilities that the town needs uh, we don't think that um, the residents um, have been heard uh, during the so-called consultation and so I'm afraid I won't support this plan, even though I understand the importance of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Ryan, next. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just to reiterate really some of the points that have been made, uh, and also by um, Fran uh, from the opposition as well. A five years land supply uh, and plan is important. I recall, and I'm sure there's an ex-councillor sitting at the back there, Tony Adams, who sat on the planning committee a long time ago with myself, and uh, when I first joined, there was all kinds of issues about land supply and developers pushing their way in on development with no control uh, from the planning committee whatsoever in terms of being able to uh, say this is not an appropriate plan and developers being able to develop willy-nilly. That's the consequence of not having a plan. Um, the issues around sites... Uh, some of them actually are justified in relation to how they appertain within local areas with the residents. And for instance, if you look at Alsham and the point that uh, Sue Catchpole has just made, it's a market town. Um, Sue, myself, and I think a few other councillors, when the proposal for this plan was being put forward under Regulation 19 ahead of going uh, in front of the hearing for the inspector, uh, I voted against the plan on the second site. I wish that second site could be withdrawn um, accordingly, and so did Sue. Um, however, we then moved forward to the hearings. I think I was the only councillor, actually, that submitted evidence along the town council uh, to the inspector to remove that second site. Um, however, the, sec the inspector has ruled that it's a sound plan. 
So this is where we are. Uh, so we are now uh, with a, an inspected plan, uh, endorsed by the inspector, apart from the amendments that have been made uh, to that plan, as, as has already been mentioned, a couple of others actually. Um, so on that basis, uh, even though I oppose that second site, um, I exercise my vote when it could have counted. Um, if the majority of councillors at that meeting had voted against on that second site, it was possible to withdraw it actually, but that wasn't the case. So we are not in a position to do anything about these sites now. Uh, so therefore, you know, I sincerely hope we do endorse this because we need a five year plan. Without it, um, we will be in a complete and utter mess in terms of planning and being able to have the allocation that uh, Councillor Clancy put forward as well. And of course, we are going to have to rely upon the private market in terms of developers for delivering the plan as well and the economy behind that, which is a very much part of it. We're not in the total position of being able to just uh, develop out because we rely upon the developers. That's part of the delivery as well. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Davison, comment there? Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, again, reflecting on uh, uh, Councillor Clancy's comments in terms of uh, the challenges ahead, I think um, uh, we need to be um, yeah, cognizant of the fact that there will be many challenges ahead. Um, and we've always said that we need to have the right houses at the right uh, in the right place um, and at an affordable price and that's a key issue um, I, I mentioned right at the beginning a comment around um, you know what we heard at the water summit in terms of the the challenges around water supply managing the demand was more housing greater the demand but we've got to reduce that demand somehow um, and non-household demand as well in the commercial uh, uh, sector um, is, is going to be very important. So that's, I see that as a, as a potential limit to growth, really. Um, and um, along with you know, other issues like nutrient uh, uh, mitigation, um, we can't um, continue polluting our environment. We've got to make sure that we, we don't do that and we actually clean it up. Um, and so uh, that adds to the challenges as well. Uh, we talked about... Um, uh, nutrient neutrality, um, uh, we're also now going to be talking about water neutrality in terms of balancing the fact that if we are going to be building more houses, we've got to make sure that we're not drawing down those resources that uh, we require uh, to sustain our environment and our living space. So there are many challenges. Um, I'm, I'm often asked around, okay, we're building these houses which are uh, energy inefficient. Well, we, we, we also need to uh, recognise that we're getting new building regulations coming along. Um, uh, the District Council have commented in the consultation on those building regulations and we'd be looking for uh, certainly much more efficient, energy efficient uh, housing, um, uh, reduced carbon emissions, reduced cost of living, uh, costs uh, of heating houses and so on. So that all comes together but it requires an integrated approach to planning. Um, and maybe we haven't quite got there yet. Um, but. We, we certainly need to work towards that um, uh, and we need a plan to be able to ensure that uh, it isn't a wild west out there, uh, which is why I support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I'd like to go to the, the second, uh, um, to Councillor Harper, if you make have any comments before I open up. Thank you, Chair. I don't think there's really anything else I can add. It's already been said. I don't want to steal the um, famous anecdote by Dan <laughs> yes again and Phil, so yeah, I'm just happy to support it. Thank you. And so can I invite the leader to respond to a little bit more final response? Yes, thank you. I think the, the two main points I would want to address is that uh, we can uh, argue about whether or not we're going to accept various sites and various places. And of course, that's going to depend very much on the local population and what they want to see in their areas. That's not what we're doing here today. This, this plan has been agreed and is appropriate and the inspectors have said so. In actual fact, if we don't have it, we are more at risk of people building where we don't want them to build. So, you know, I, that's the danger we have if we don't vote for this plan. So that would be the one aspect. The other aspect is, you know, it's not a case of uh, we can just pick where we have a, a settlement area. The landowner has to be prepared to put their land forward for, for development. Uh, so, again, that's another aspect of, of what happens when you ask people if they want to do that. These are the places that we've got available. Uh, I still think this is a very sound plan. I think that we can all agree that we've had those discussions over and over again in the iterations coming up to this final point. 
what we have now, I think, is a good plan that the inspectors have agreed fits the national policy, is acceptable, and I really urge everybody to vote for it. Thank you. Thank you very much there. So I'd just like to refer members then to the recommendations of page 26, and they're listed down here on the agenda. I'd like to invite a show of hands and um, get them going. So, all those in favour? Thank you very much. And all those against? One. Thank you very much. That's carried. So move on to item 7B, the strategic asset management framework. So can I invite the leader to please present the recommendations from Cabinet? Thank you. Yes, I think this is exactly what it says on the tin. It's We have quite a lot of assets in this council. Up until now, they have been uh, identified under the various departments. That sometimes makes things very difficult to manage. I think this particular framework has attempted, and I think has done it quite well, is to bring all those things together, to categorise them, to identify their value, and be a much more structured way of dealing with the assets this council owns. So I would, I think that's really all I can say. It, it, it's, it's fairly self-explanatory, I think. So um, I urge you all to vote for it. Thank you. Okay. Seconded by Councillor Riley there. Um, do you wish to respond now or reserve the right? Okay, thank you. Um, now, inviting comments from any members. Have you got any comments you'd like to make? Councillor Emtoy first. Um, yeah, if we look at the table on page 132, I agree that the having the assets like this in this strategic framework is, is a very good idea but I don't find that table to be very transparent and clear um, we did raise this at, um, when we, we obviously saw this over in scrutiny and I think it would have been nice to have seen a, a change made I don't know if that has been possible but obviously where we've got officers there where it's 18 million I don't really think that classing the Broadland Food Innovation Centre as a as an office is is very clear. That was a massive project that we've done. We've worked really hard for. So I think that should be a separate line. Um, the business support centre. Um, we know that's um, Carabrec Training Centre. Uh, again, another project which highlighted that training is important to Broadland, and I think that would be nice to keep that separate. Um, and obviously going down a little bit more, we obviously have um, other things that we know about. For instance, I know where our key is, but I would think there are many members who don't, and I think that would be a, a bit better if that would be a bit clearer. So happy with the overall report and everything. It's just the, the table to me, we're, we're looking at being more transparent and clearer on what we've actually got, and I, I don't find that table to be that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Crotch next. Thanks, Chairman. Um, yeah, just in respect of the Bure Valley Railway, again on um, page 132, I see the valuation down here is at 362,000, which I think is about 2016-17 valuation. My recollection from Economic Success Panel was that in February 2022, there was an updated valuation that was presented to Council, and I just wonder why that valuation um, has not been uh, referred to in this table. Thank you very much. Councillor Clancy next. I think that was my point was covered. The only, only other thing is just it, it's just to reclassify, I think Councillor Emsel's already mentioned, to reclassify the business support centre as a business training centre. And I think that's quite important as well in view of when we acquired the building, there was um, considerable covenants placed on that by the NHS who we acquired it from that they can and should only be used as a training centre. So I think that's just quite important just to um, just to amend that. Again, the principle of the whole document, very happy with. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Riley, you want to speak, please? Yeah, um, I'll come on to the, the document. Just in relation to Jonathan's point, uh, 
I do recall, John, this is you raising that O and S actually, uh, and I do recall Debbie's uh, reply, just to reconfirm here, that this list was taken from the, uh, you'll see there at the bottom asset value is for the capital accounting purpose and is not necessarily related to the market value um, as at 31st and 3rd, 23. So simply take from that list, however, um, as I understand it, in reiterating this through Rodney um, in the right, right way, uh, that will be categorised differently and shown differently in the future, but it's simply taken from that list, um, so that covers the point. In relation to the document itself, it's a very important document actually for the Council. Uh, we have not had a, a strategy as, uh, asset management document before, and it is important because when you go to the uh, to page one, two, three in the summary, uh, you'll see that the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors and the Chartered Institute of Public Finance Account, uh, Accountancy, CIPFA, uh, this is within their recommendations and it's actually within best practice. And by having this document, we can it actually helps you to focus in and drive a capital requirement, uh, requirements in the future in terms of where you need to focus uh, investment possibly, uh, and you'll see that throughout the document. And possibly the important page here, one of the most important pages here, is the action action plan. So on page 140, uh, you'll see, I'll just turn to it myself actually, uh, on page 140, you'll see a whole list of action plans. And the first one on there is to undertake conditional survey on all buildings in the next four years. By doing that on a regular basis, which you should do, uh, you'll constantly uh, have, a, have an input of where those values are, what the conditions are, and what you need to do to update them, and before they get into such a state of disrepair that also it's going to cost you a lot of money. So it's, it's got a whole lot of value to doing that, and that's why the Institute of Surveyors recommend this as well. If you run through the page, you see a whole list of, of uh, issues and items that we need to focus in on, and there's a plan moving forward with a date policy behind it. It's a very important document for us. It's one that this council's needed, I, I suggest, for quite some time. And I'm, I'm pleased to hear uh, uh, also Stuart Clancy, who I know has had an interest in this whole thing for a long time, also support the document. Uh, so, yeah, happy to second this, Chair. Thank you very much. Can I invite the leader to respond? I think that's quite comprehensive, isn't it? I think, um, I think the, the central point is that when you have a lot of assets and you are a public organisation, you have a responsibility to the people who effectively own our council, if you like, our residents and our companies, to manage those assets properly. And what we have here is a way of doing that. It's a recommended way to make sure that we understand what we own, we know when we've last inspected it, we're quite clear about what the value is, we can check to see whether it's being updated or needs updating. There's a whole raft of things that we can do. Without this sort of plan, what you can end up with, if you're not careful, is a bit of a random selection of things. Oh, well, I'll have a look at that this year. So my feeling is this has been well put forward. I hear what people are saying about some of the categories, but it had to match the categories. I think Steve has just said it had to match the categories we already list things under. It will be reviewed. I think that's the whole point of the plan. So it's not just that we've written it and we're finishing with it and we get it. You know, this, this will be an ongoing process. So I would heartily urge you all to vote for it. I'm sure you will see that it's of our, in our best interest to do that. Thank you very much. So I'd like to refer members to the recommendations at page 26 um, to recommend the council that approves and adopts a strategic asset management framework. So all those in favour, please. That's, that's carried. Thank you very much, everyone. Moving on to the next item, item 7C, so the Norfolk Nutrient uh, Mitigation Fund, Schemes and Governance. I invite the leader again to uh, present the recommendation to cabinet, from Cabinet, please. Thank you. Yes, this is really very, very exciting, actually. <laughs> I don't know if I can get excited, but I do feel excited by this. Um, it is a really good scheme. What we have been very successful in doing, and I can only commend the officers for this, um, that we put in an expression of interest for monies from the government to help manage uh, nutrient neutrality. Uh, we've done that on behalf of a range of councils. It's not just us. It will be also uh, South Norfolk, Breckland, North Norfolk, Norwich. Um, we're all part of the group that have, uh, will be part of this. But Broadland will be the accountable authority because we submitted the bid. 
this particular piece of document here is a way it's just to make sure that we have a proper way of managing it. So it's all very, it's lovely that we got 9.6 million, but we need to be absolutely clear that we know what we're doing with it and that we are inviting the right sorts of projects to come forward, which will actually can do those mitigations that we need. And again, be able to do that will also help us to deliver the housing that we've just said we need in the Greater Norwich Local Plan. So all of these things come together. This whole governance structure is designed such that we will have the officer working group, which will actually uh, monitor and evaluate any bids that come forward to, to arrange for these sorts of mitigations before we actually are recommended to give them any money. There will be a member group, which will be chaired by Broadland, uh, which will have a member from each of the planning authorities sitting on it, and they will then confirm or not, as the case may be, their agreement with those things. The whole idea about this as well is, I'm sure you all know, that the mitigations that will be required in different areas, sometimes they're going to be harder to get to, so sometimes they'll be quite relatively easy, other times they're going to be quite difficult. Ways of evaluating those are really important. So I think by having an officer group and then a member group, those two groups together will actually judge those uh, those bids and those those options and take them take these projects forward. So Broadland is quite fortunate in that we've actually bid for it and we got that money. Uh, there are no costs to Broadland in this. The the funding is already invested and any monies that are used to manage it will be will come from that 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 investment. So in to cut a very long story short, it's an extremely well thought through uh, program, I would suggest, and a governance uh, set up, uh, and I would hope that you will all be happy to, to vote with it. Um, I think the other councils are very happy for us to be able to do that, and it's just important that as we bid for it and we are the accountable body, that we are very clear about how we manage that and that we take forward things that will benefit each of the councils that are involved. So I think this, this docu set of documents does that. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there and wait for any comments. Thank you. Can I ask for a second, please? Yes. Catherine Davis, do you wish to speak now or is that right? Oh, thank you. And now I invite comments from any members, please. Mm -hmm. Councillor Gurney, first then, please. Thank you, Vice Chairman. I refer to the terms of reference uh, for the member working group on page 167 and ask the question, given the membership of the group, which is cross-party, how are you going to come to a political consensus on the political input into the allocation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Clancy, next. I think Councillor Gurney just asked, answered the question I was going to ask, Chair. Thank you much. Any more comments from Councillor Emsall? Yeah, I, I think um, when neutral, neutrality came out and we, we heard about the issues being raised, it did take most councils by surprise. And we've, we've, we've seen the struggle for the, the building industry from this. Um, it is excellent to see that we have our officers that took the lead on this instead of just sort of wondering how the government were going to sort it out. We did start working on this straight away, which was really good to be a, the lead in it. Um, and I, I do have to sort of be impressed with our officers and how they are leading probably in East Anglia on this. And I think this is really, really positive. So it is good to see that we've worked something through. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Davis, you'd like to respond? Yes. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Um, yeah, I'm certainly uh, happy to, to support this. I think we need to remember that um, it's unfortunate that we're in this situation in the first place, that we need um, uh, the mitigation actions. Um, it's, uh, and perhaps I uh, maybe disagree with Councillor Emsall, really, that it's uh, not such a surprise. I know it came in quickly, but you know we're aware that we have polluted water courses, that we have nutrient um, overload. And uh, we've had algal blooms and so on uh, for several summers. Uh, and so we, we do need to do something about it. So um, I'm very happy to support this um, because we clearly need a solution. Um, but we shouldn't be surprised that we're here in the first place. And it does reflect somewhat in, uh, in past policies. Um, and um, um, I think many warnings that were given uh, around... Um, managing our development in a way which is, is responsible and um, 
uh, avoids these kind of situations developing in the future. Um, so happy to um, uh, support this. Um, I, I think in terms of the uh, question around uh, political balance and how to, to manage that, I think um, you know we're within Broughton District Council um, working in a very successful partnership across political parties um, and uh, can see that um, we have some common aims here in terms of uh, how we see our county and our districts um, and the need to have uh, effective uh, solutions to the problems that we're confronted with uh, and that I'd hope that we can work collectively and effectively together on that. So very much want to support this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I um, well, at least respond to the little bit? Thank you, yes. Um, I'm guessing you're referring to the fact that, um, just to answer Councillor Gurney's point, is that uh, the fact that the parties will work together in good faith in an open, cooperative and collaborative manner. Um, I'm absolutely confident that every council that is represented here, and I would suggest in this room as well, is very keen to make sure that housing gets built where it's needed. Um, I don't think any of us would dispute that. And I think that applies across the councils. We've already had a member working group on this, uh, a, a meeting to look at these, these uh, options. It was agreed that we would do the same uh, process that was undertaken with the Greater Norwich Local Plan and the Greater Norwich Development Board in that we would expect that these decisions would be taken in a unanimous way. Um, I don't think anybody had a problem with that. Uh, I, I know there are all different colors represented in that particular member group, but I am confident that every council wants to see development go ahead where it is planned to go ahead. And the only way we're going to build that housing is by agreeing these sorts of schemes. This, don't forget, is simply a government's uh, report that sets out how we will manage that money. I genuinely do believe that everybody who was present at the meeting is firmly convinced that this is the best way forward. We have that money, 9.6 million to spend. The only other point I would add to that, you will see that because Broadland is the accountable body, if for some reason there were a split decision, at some point somebody has to decide what's happening with the money. Um, it does, the, the terms of reference do also state that the leader or the, the chair of the group will take count of the views, but ultimately it is Broadland that is accountable for the spending of that money. But honestly, I do not see that there will be an issue with that. It was a very productive meeting that we've already held, and I can see this going forward and being extremely useful for, for all councils in our region that are taking part in it. So I'm, I'm again going to uh, ask you to vote for it because I think this is a good document that will help us to govern and manage that money spending well. Thank you. I'd like to refer members to the recommendations on page 26 to recommend to the council that agrees to add 9.6 million to the BDC capital programme. So can I invite members to show hands, please? Ones in favour? That's carried, thank you very much. Moving on to item number eight in the agenda, so the housing complaints policy. Can I ask Councillor Harfleet to present the report, please? Thank you, Chair. So the Housing Ombudsman has provided guidance on how complaints should be dealt with within our role as a registered provider. So just to make that clear, that is strictly our temporary accommodation. This isn't our wider housing issue. So the complaints can only be about the conditions of the properties. It's not about, I don't like that I've been on the waiting list for however many months or I'm not happy where my housing is allocated. It's strictly about the condition of our temporary accommodation within our role as a registered provider. Now, you will have noticed that this hasn't gone through the policy development panel or ONS as it would normally. That is because the housing ombudsman's timetable did not align with local government. We did ask whether it would be okay if we could just put in an interim policy as a a kind of holding position until the review, which is due to be completed in October anyway, but they said no. So this is why we have had to go straight to this as I believe it was the end of February when the guidelines were finally published and officers had an opportunity to question them via a webinar. So we have not had the time to do um, the usual route and we were refused 
being able to have an interim policy. The policy itself is quite clearly laid out here. It is very self-explanatory. It is quite dry. I can't gel it up to make it sound more exciting, but it's all there for you. So if you have any questions, please fire away. Can I ask for a seconder, please? Yeah. Thank you very much. Do you still reserve the right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so no, no. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Uh, just a quick question to Councillor Hopley. The, uh, the title of this is the Housing Complaints Policy, and that's going to be on the Council's website, I assume. Um, people looking for general complaints might get confused. Is it not possible to have the name to reflect what it actually is about, rather than just the housing complaints policy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Any more members? Any comments you wish to make? Any other questions? Um, so, uh, sorry. Councillor Holland, <laughs> you want to speak now? Yeah, I think I can, I can more or less answer that question. I think the housing complaints policy is precisely what the Ombudsman expects you to call it. I don't think there's an actual option to call it something else, but I will be corrected if I'm, I'm wrong about that. Um, I would suggest that underneath it, it does say that this is applicable to tenants of Broad and District Council. And I think we all know there are very few properties we actually own that we are responsible for. So I think it's quite clear who it refers to, and there will be detail underneath that on the website to explain precisely what it is that you can uh, put in your complaint about. I do accept that sometimes complaint policies are a bit sort of wordy and are difficult to understand, but I think we are talking about tenants of Broad and District Council. I'm not quite sure how many that might be, but we own about nine properties at the moment, don't we, in total? So, or, or maybe a few more, but, but certainly not more than that. So, so there's going to be a fairly limited audience for the time being anyway. So um, as far as I'm concerned, I think the policy itself is sound. Um, I think it makes it very clear who it's for. It clarifies precisely what you're allowed to, to complain about. Uh, so I think really that there isn't much more to say about it. I think Natasha has said it is quite dry, um, but obviously um, it's essential. And it's unfortunate that the Ombudsman decided that they would tell us in February, at the end of February, that we needed to get this done by the end of March. But it is what it is, and we've done it, so that's good. Thank you very much, Councillor Holland. Uh, Councillor Hartley, for the wrap-up, please. Yes, and um, thank you for the questions. When it is actually published, it will make it quite clear. We have to call it what it's called. There will be supporting statements to make it even more clear. Um, but it is what it is. We have to do this to, to meet legal requirements. If we don't get this done on time, we're not meeting our requirements as a registered provider. So any other supporting statements on our website will make it very clear. But as I said, this isn't about our broad housing complaints policy. It is just relating to our role as an RP, and it is just relating to our temporary accommodation. Those people know who they are. Anybody else will be following a different route because they know who they are. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to refer members to the recommendations, page 175 agenda, and I'd like to invite a show of hands. All those in favour? That's carried, thank you. So moving on to item number nine on the agenda, so the pay policy statement 2024-25. I'd like to invite Councillor Roper to present the report, please. Thank you, Chair. This is a report which comes to us at this time every year uh, when the blossom is forming on the trees um, in that we need to get it in place uh, before the new financial year uh, and to get it um, approved by Council prior to its publication on the Council website. Um, the report is set out in front of you. What you'll see is a couple of changes um, from previous years which have been developed over time. Uh, the first of these is the move to national pay negotiation uh, from 24-25 onwards. That's been agreed with Unison um, as part of our local pay negotiations um, this year. And secondly, the move from performance-related pay uh, to pay progression, uh, which sets out the scale point for each pay band with a criteria that needs to be met to move through um, those scale points. Um, this is beneficial because it is good for recruitment and it's good for retention in that the staff know uh, and in terms of their expectations about what they are, are going to come to uh, when they move to Broadland and South Norfolk 
of district councils. Um, it's also good as far as budgeting is concerned. Um, we'd like to work on the basis that our staff are all excellent and will move through their pay scales, um, but we're very confident in management that they will take matters up um, if any members of staff don't actually happen to do so. Um, so I commend this report to you and happy to take any questions. Can I ask for a seconder, please? Can you want a seconder? Yeah. Councillor Riley there. Do you want to speak now or reserve your right? I'll reserve the right. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, look, any comments from members there? So, Councillor Jones there. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, this is my first year on council, and I have to say I am a little bit surprised, and I'm sure our residents would be, to know that um, directors of, of Broadland Council get paid more than MPs do, and our managing director, who is, who is brilliant, but he gets paid more than the Prime Minister. Uh, it just it surprises me that the the pay levels are set where they are. So, oh, it probably surprises me more that our MPs and Prime Minister get paid, uh, you know, less than people who work in a local council. So, that was what surprised me. So, thank you. Any other comments, members? Yes. Councillor Lamon, then. Yes, uh, thank you for this report and for the detail. I mean, it looks very sensible that the council takes this on. Uh, my question is, is there going to be a difference in costs to the council when we look at the cost of the previous um, pay policy compared with taking this new one on? So what will be the cost difference? Will it be costing the council more or less? Or, Yeah, thank you. Any more comments from members? No, Councillor Riley, respond please. Um, just in relation to the comment about pay, um, there's always speculation, as you know, amongst the public about what um, local authority uh, chief executives or whatever get paid in comparison with the Prime Minister, etc., etc. Uh, probably best not for me to comment on that myself at the moment. Um, all I would say is, is that the um, rates for the directors, ADs, and also the managing director uh, was set by the previous administration uh, and also in South Norfolk uh, going back to um, just prior to 2019 and then during the advertisement period for that. Um, and they were set at that period of time. Um, so I'll just make that point. Um, <coughs> In relation to uh, the question about the uh, differential, um, I could give a response to that. I'll just ask Councillor Roper first of all if he wants to or if he's happy with me. Okay. Okay. As I understand it, there is a differential. Um, I believe, uh, I've not got an accurate uh, report on this at the moment, but I think that could be across both councils around about £300,000. Um, however, there are issues associated with that in terms of um, where the staff are, unison, and what we had previously to that. Um, the, as we understand it, it's already helping in terms of our retention and recruitment, because the old system was not helping us, to say the least. And the old system, I remember when this came in, I go back that far in the council continuously. I know Dan does as well. There's a few other members, uh, one that's not council anymore, sitting right at the back. Um, when uh, um, the previous system came in and we had a national uh, downward pressure on pay, public play, pay, and recommendations from the government around 1%, etc. And there was also part of the iteration from Unison, as I understand at that time, being in some performance related. So there was some performance related measure, measure reports on that, but it doesn't really assist an organisation like ours to retain staff or to recruit staff. Um, so it is something that affects revenue budgets. Uh, however, we've got to run accounts, we've got to run it the best way we can, and we've got to have the staff. And I think really they are then there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you much. Uh, Councillor Roper, I'll respond to the debate, please. Thank you. Clearly, it's in our interest to recruit the best possible people to serve our residency in, in terms of our officer team. Uh, and our, our pay policy is, is structured to um, attract that. I would say that the um, uh, the £300,000 which um, 
Councillor Riley has said, is across both councils. Um, it's not just for us. Uh, and that's well within the, the budget, um, which has been set as far as uh, salaries is concerned, that we passed at the last meeting. As far as Councillor Jones's point about comparing the, the salaries to those of MPs, I suppose it depends on the number of applicants for the jobs, doesn't it? And um, I think there are thousands of people across the country who want to be um, MPs and um, a very small number of very specialised people who have got the skills and knowledge that we need to be the directors or the managing directors um, of our one team. Um, and I think that, that explains the difference. Thank you very much, Chair. I'd like to refer members to the recommendations at page 185 um, to approve the content of Board of District Council's 2024-25 pay policy. Um, can I have members a show of hands, please? All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to item number 10 on the agenda here, programme of committee meetings on page 198. Um, just asking the council to endorse the programme meetings and ask members to indicate by show hands uh, any comments on that one first, probably. Well, no. Okay, show of hands. Is all those in favour of the programme of committee meetings? Yes. Okay. That's, that's carried, thank you. On to item number 11, reports from outside organisations. I'd like to advise members there's no reports received from outside um, organisations. Um, on to item number 12 on the agenda, so questions from members. Um, we have a question here from Councillor Lacey Douglas. So can I invite Councillor Douglas to ask her a question? There's uh, two minutes allowed on the time here on the front. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Who took the decision to issue paper bills to residents who had signed up for e-billing? How much did this cost and was this an effective use of taxpayers' money? Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I invite Councillor Riley to respond, please? You have five minutes. Councillor Reddy. Oh, thank, oh. thank you. It's, it's, it's passed to me because IT comes under my portfolio, and this is really an IT question um, that you put forward. And, and, and thank you for the question. Um, the short answer is that there, nobody took a decision that we were going to start issuing paper bills um, this year. Um, what you'll be aware is that we have implemented a new joint revenue and benefits IT system, uh, which is designed to save half a million pounds over seven years. Um, and that followed on from the business case, which I think the, the previous cabinet passed back in March 2022. The position which we've had is that the new system, we are the first council in the country to adopt it. Um, as one of the teething issues we had was around data migration, uh, because we have customers with lot and residents with lots of different types of account with us, some of which they have e-billing, some of which they've been receiving paper billing. And the system had some issues as far as rationalising that through uh, and was defaulting to issuing paper bills for those <coughs> customers. Now, in order to avoid the possibility that there could be some customers who didn't receive a council tax bill, um, we made sure that um, those bills did go out. Um, we are seeing this as a, as a glitch in the system uh, for this year only. It has affected both councils um, equally uh, because we both use the same system and we are in the process of seeking some recompense from the provider um, to cover that. So I'm not going to give a firm figure tonight as far as how much it's cost. Sure, you know, it's clearly it's not a good use of council taxpayers' money uh, to be sending out paper bills when they could be doing e-billing. And I would encourage anybody in the room who hasn't signed up for e-billing, who is a member, please do so in the future. Uh, and hopefully we will get it right in, in future years uh, and well and truly save this half a million pounds which the uh, project is designed to achieve. Thank you very much. I'd last ask Councillor Douglas if any supplementary questions there. Um, when will that data migration be corrected <coughs> and have all data of secretary checked? Thank you. I'm, I'm having regular uh, meetings and updates with the officers on, on this. Um, as far as I'm aware, that the, the data migration is well and truly um, almost finished. I'll make absolutely sure with the officers that there aren't any last nooks and crannies that haven't been touched uh, when I next have meetings with the officers next week. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Moving on to item number 13 on the agenda, so motions. Advise members there's no motions been received this evening's meeting. So I'd like to declare that this uh, meeting is closed at 8.02, we'll go.